we now have an opportunity to answer any general questions that you may have after the day's proceedings um, on anything we'll do our very best to answer directed towards any of the panel here to, um, this afternoon or indeed um, panellists who may have been available this morning. Does anybody have any general questions? Yes. Um, you've referred to barriers that make it difficult to predict the rate of progression for the treatments that we also urgently want to see. Um, scientific barriers aside, are there barriers? Could you describe the barriers that you face or you anticipate and any actions that patient organisations can take to help remove or tackle those barriers? So you're quite right that there are a number of different barriers and you, you you've touched on the scientific barriers because some of the scientific barriers we... we have difficulty actually anticipating um, the development process uh, requires a, uh, some degree of exploration um, and there may be barriers that we simply can't predict and simply can't, can't anticipate so those can certainly delay proceedings that aside as you say there certainly there are barriers related to resource and so in order to, act to actually identify a treatment a potential treatment and to um, help navigate through the very um, arduous and, and perhaps slightly cumbersome regulatory um, submissions process to get something into a, a clinical trial is really very uh, expensive. And um, anything that can be done to help to raise the funds to help support that is, is fantastically valuable. Um, funds raised through, through charity work, um, as indeed we've demonstrated with Morefields, our charity, um, are very powerful because they can help to lever additional funds from elsewhere. Um, and so for, ev for every amount that we can, we can secure from one source, we can often secure several fold that from other sources. And so there's a great deal of um, leverage um, potential, um, which is very, ha very helpful. Um, in addition to working with charities, we've, we've found that working um, with commercial partners is really very effective um, because they, they can also bring huge resource as well as expertise. Um, and in addition... Um, we've recently embarked on, a, on our own commercial e enterprise um, that we think will considerably accelerate um, the development of the new treatments. Can I add to that to mimic, uh, I to mimic the, the comments from Mr. Uh, Roy Smith this morning that the, the charities and the, well, basically everybody could also pressurise politicians, governments, et cetera, to, to support NHS, to support science funding, which is under pressure at the moment, um, to keep this work going, because however much the charities do, uh, most of the funding still, for, for, the, for the basic research, still comes from the MRC and the medical and the, and the government. Uh, so uh, a lot of pressure could be applied there. Mm. Any other questions? The, back, the blue shirt, maybe? I yeah. think um, just another quick point. Is it now also a good time to say something about the funding that's received from EU sources for, e for medical research? Because I think this is one of the great unknowns that most of the population are unaware that the UK is a massive beneficiary of EU funding for research. If we vote in a year or two's time to leave the EU, then a lot of that uh, collaboration will start to evaporate. Very, very true. Um, our group alone has received four um, research uh, grants from the EU, one of them actually quite substantial, supporting the stem cell work, and without that money we would be um, in, a, in a far worse position, absolutely. Another question here. Uh, in in all of the, the talk so far, um, retinal prosthesis has only been mentioned for little more than a few seconds. Um, what What is the situation at the moment with retinal prosthesis? And what, if any, barriers um, uh, 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 um, uh, sorry, um, what, if any, barriers are, are preventing f um, further developments in the field of retinal prosthesis? So there are a number of different electronic devices that are being used to explore 
the potential benefit um, when implanted into the eye. These um, are very exciting um, opportunities for people who, with very severe sight impairment. Um, and the uh, study so far show some very exciting um, indications of potential. The degree, the level of benefit um, from the current devices is such that the, uh, the authorities in this country um, have judged them insufficient to give um, approval as a, as a approved treatment. Um, but it's clear that further de with further development, they might actually result in um, greater benefit that could, be, that could reach the level of, of something which is potentially fundable from the health service. At the moment, the limitations are that the quality of, of sight that they can offer is really quite limited. Um, certainly, it's true that people with the implants can actually perform um, certain tasks much more effectively um, in controlled environments. But the limitation is such that the potential benefit is, is not sufficient yet to enable them to actually change their way of life. So even though they can perform these tasks better, they still find it, in reality, easier to manage with the aid of um, other skills that they've acquired um, during, their, during, their, um, during their lives, um, inclu including just simply the use of a white stick, for example, to find the way around. So although there is great potential, um, at the moment it's limited. It's hoped that with developments in electronics, the, the resolution of the devices will improve such that the benefit will be greater. Does that include the problem what I call the public health issue? That the public So there are there are optical implants that are being used. These are not electronic implants, but optical implants to, to offer magnification to people with macular degeneration. Um, and the advantage of those is that they, they can offer magnification, but the disadvantage is they're only useful if, um, if people are monocular and they only have one seeing eye, because otherwise it causes double vision. And secondly, the downside of the increased magnification is that there is a substantially reduced field of view, and that for some people can be quite disabling. So that is um, another exciting opportunity, but still a subject of ongoing research. Yes. Are there any words to produce retina cells other than what you have? Rather than? Just working on stem cells or green cells or something. There is scientific research trying to produce retinal cells. Retinal cells, yes. Yeah. So, retinal altogether. Yeah. So the most, most projects using stem cells um, involve developing those cells into retinal cells before they are transplanted. Good. If there are no more, is there one more question here? I better stand up. Even when I'm standing, people say, can you stand up, please? <laughs> um, most, if not all speakers, have mentioned research and some have also mentioned mice and rats or whatever. What I'm wondering is, do you do any research in human beings? And if so, how can we help? Yes, much of the research we've been talking about this afternoon is indeed done in human beings. So the stem cell trial is ongoing. It's one that's been done in humans. And likewise, the gene therapy trial that we talked about earlier on is also being done in, in humans. Um, and this is, this is very much research, which has um, uh, potential benefits for people with those specific conditions, but also, we hope, will have implications for people with all sorts of different retinal conditions, including other forms of retinitis pigmentosa um, and age-related macular degeneration. So, absolutely, we're doing research in in um, humans. And in terms of helping, well, you're helping by being here today to help to comment on, on our research, help to guide us in terms of our research priorities and all the help you've done in terms of um, 
asking questions to highlight your particular areas of concerns using your, your, the, the post-it notes and your interactions with the, um, with the exhibitors and the scientists in the hall are all absolutely helpful. This will help, to help us to design our research program to make sure it's um, as well aligned as possible with your hopes and dreams. Um, and it's, it's exactly for that, to address that question that, that we're all here today. I think the, the, the clear things for dry MD are there, there are certain life, lifestyle factors, lifestyle um, measures that can be taken to help to protect site. Um, of course, there is, there is risk of site deterioration. It's important to consult a, an expert if you have any concerns about any um, sudden deterioration in site. And absolutely, I would encourage people to get involved with charities and with patient organisations to make sure that their, their concerns are personal concerns are addressed and that collectively um, everybody's concerns are, are met and to enable us as researchers to prioritise your concerns. So it would be prosthesis presumably as opposed to ocular or waiting on stem cells, it would be, that would be the most forward thing at the moment for it's a practical I think there are a number of poten potential avenues, and I think, as, as Michael earlier on suggested, there's all sorts of different potential um, measures that include not only lifestyle measures, but also potentially drugs that could help in dry AMD in the future, um, potentially vitamin supplements of one sort or another, um, other sorts of medication, potentially injections in the eye, potentially laser treatments of, of different sorts. I think, actually, the retinal prosthesis is, is unlikely to be um, necessary in people with dry AMD. Um, because even people with advanced sight loss with AMD do retain some sight, which is better than those who can, who even have working prostheses. Yeah. 